Terry Gilliam was described by New York Times film critic Janet Maslin as, quote, the resident madman of the movies. His extraordinary and fantastical images, from his work with Monty Python's Flying Circus to his films like Time Bandits and Brazil, represent some of the most unforgettable scenes in modern film. Gilliam's first film since his multi-Oscar nominated Fisher King is 12 Monkeys. It stars Bruce Willis as a prisoner from the year 2035, sent to 1996 to discover the source of a deadly plague that has forced humanity underground. I'm pleased to have Terry Gilliam here to talk about this business and this art and this craft of making movies. Welcome. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Uh, tell me about this film first, and then I want to look back at, really? at a career and some other things. And I apologize to the audience because these I've got little brass buttons. This is not the jacket I meant, and so they'll be yeah, bumping around. Reality, what the yeah. hell? Yeah. Tell me, noise tell me about twelve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> tell me about twelve monkeys and this idea, and and how does one sort of look at it? In a, it's funny because you've actually described about a, ma uh, a man who comes back from the future to do something. The, the film actually is much more ambivalent than that because yeah. for most of the film you don't know whether he's a man who's come back from the future or just another wacko apocalypse <laughs> nut. Yeah, yeah. Which and makes it interesting on that's that. That's right, because that's part of what it's about. It's very much about perception of reality is what the film is really about. Uh, and and it's it also, because of this guy coming back from a future which is fairly repressive and restricted, we don't like it, but it's kind of a known quantity. When he enters our world, it's like a Martian coming into our world, and the rules that he understands don't apply. And it's a way of looking at where we are now, I think, is what it is. And it's, that's what intrigues me about it. The fact that there's a great tale being woven through this thing is something else. But it's just a chance to sort of make us think, look at what the world is, what it isn't, what we think it is, what it isn't, what kind of information we're getting. Because we seem to be inundated with information. Yeah. It's hard to know what the real stuff is, which the stuff is that counts. And I think it's the hardest thing in modern society is to know what to listen to and what not to. And this character, I mean, in a sense, you want the, the audience in the theater not to really know how this yeah. character is... No, I don't think I don't think it's it's clear through most of the film which it is. I'm not going to tell which, because yeah. what you've set up may be a total lie. This is what's great about television. <laughs> we can do this. We can lie to millions of people. <laughs> oh no, no, no! If we do it with a straight face, they'll believe really, Charlie. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> tell me this: Do you see before I show a clip of Twelve yeah. Monkeys? Do you see what you do as a filmmaker any different you think than most other directors? Look at whatever the top fifteen grossing yeah. films are this evening and is your sort of sense of what I'm trying to do dramatically different so that a Janet Maslin will say you know you're the resident madman of movie yeah. I, mean, I think I work hard at trying to at least offer up a different perception of the world <laughs> that's one of the reasons I stay in England I live 6,000 miles away from Hollywood because anybody working in the film industry is surrounded by so many people who seem to accept a certain worldview at any one moment yeah. at any week and and films get made by uh, by people agreeing with that and i want to stay away from that i want to off offer up other views of what the world might be like and i've i've really been lucky getting my films they fall through the cracks at the right time it seems to me somehow the system isn't as good as it ought to be so the system should be excluding me in my work but no we somehow <laughs> managed to get through there is there a link between monty python and 12 monkeys only to the extent, extent that Monty Python got away with murder, and so is 12 Monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> what, what? <laughs> All right, take a look at this. Let's set this up. He has a history. This is year 2035, and Bruce Willis is given an ultimatum to return to Earth in the past. Here it is. Take a, talking about yeah. that clip, Bruce Willis, tell me about him as an actor, because what appeals to me about him is that he'll do Die Hard 1, 2, 3, yeah. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, yeah. and make you know, gazillion dollars, yeah. uh, married to a very attractive lady, and then at the same time takes risk and goes and does films where he doesn't have a necessarily, you know, starring role, yeah. has an important role, yeah. whether it's Pulp Fiction or yeah. something else, and gets approving judgments by critics. He really, Bruce knows he's a success, he knows he's got an audience, and I think he really is desperate to show the world that he's a good actor as well. He wants that kind of respect I think is, is is the word and he is really a good actor I think a lot of people I mean when when people see this film I mean he puts himself through everything there's no kind of no fear in what he's doing I mean he will look as ugly he will look as disturbed as possible he's what was interesting for him in this one was to be a character that had 
no net, no safety net as as far as clever one-liners or yeah. smirk, the smirk, any of those things. I said, you're, you're naked in this one. And, and normally these characters tend to be fairly, um, ex the, 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 they're external, they, yeah. they go out. This one had to be totally, totally internalized and, he, and it had it'd be lost. He actually has to find, in two scenes, which are my favorite scenes almost, he becomes a child almost. That kind of innocence, that total vulnerability, and vulnerable, and, and, and it's and, and it's curiosity. It's it's wonderful, and it's just and you really care. Now he's when we were working, I, I explained when if we were going to do this film when we first met, I said you can't bring the entourage, you can't do any of that stuff. Right, right. You've got to be this a, is not naked. Big, you're naked time, right? right now, and he's in like I would swear he's he's probably in ninety percent of the shots in this film. He's like yeah. on nonstop, and he's it's it's he, he intrigues me. I mean he's he's smart, and I think he knows that. He wants to go on working, and he wants to provide as many possibilities for himself. No other choice in your mind when you decided to direct this, that he was your... No, no, not, not actually true, because I didn't want to work with a big star, to be honest. So you didn't I, want him, even? I didn't want big stars, period. Yeah. I wanted to keep the film, you know, with smaller actors, less well-known actors, less expensive ones, because I wanted to maintain control. Uh, and I thought, because it's ah, such... Ah, ah. <laughs> and, I, and I thought from the studio's point of view, because it's a very demanding kind of script, it's a very intelligent yeah. thing, that they were going to get nervous. So that the cheaper I could make it, the less nervous they would be, basically, is my theory. That's and, true. <laughs> yeah, and it, it works. <laughs> that way. But he, the, the studio wanted a name because they thought that's how you can sell the film. Yeah. Opening weekend seems right, to be right. everything. And and they threw a lot of names at me, and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm off. Goodbye. Nice yeah. talking to you. Yeah. It's not, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, because they were all totally inappropriate I mean, people. You have, a, I mean, you're fearless about that. I mean, it, you, there's no project you want so much to do that if it, in fact, uh, cuts into your control, you'll just walk. No. You don't need to do this. You no. don't need the money. You don't need the opportunity. No. You don't need nothing. I made a choice my junior year of college. Yeah. <laughs> Here he goes, the old man speaking. Yes. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you how I got mine. <laughs> and I was working in the Chevrolet assembly plant on the assembly line uh, on the night shift trying to work my way through college. And I said, this is a waste of my life. I'm not yeah. going to do it. And I quit and said, I will never work for money in my life and I will never do anything I don't have total control over. And I stuck with it. And it took a long time to get where it, I What was the movie where you fought for control? Was that Brazil? What was Brazil. It? Well, I actually had control. What happened was that uh, 20th Century Fox had it for the world, and Universal had it for North America. <laughs> now, Fox released it in the world, yeah. and it was you know, very highly right. praised, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Universal uh, got very frightened by it. They, because their opinion of the American public was rather low at those yeah. points, and that you've got to have a happy ending. You've yeah. got to, you know, the idea of a satisfying ending doesn't interest them. Happy ending. And so I got in a big fight with them and said, if you want a different film, then let's make a different film in the future. Yeah. But we agreed to make this film. <laughs> all the actors got together. We all, you yeah. read the script, we all agreed, yeah. and now you want to tell a different story? I don't think so. And it ended up in a big public battle. Yeah. Are you a little bit too young to be having a retrospective? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'll be... I'm now 55. What yeah. do you think? Yeah. Well, it's a little young. Yeah. But, but I mean, how it's do like you see like a kiss of death, isn't it? This is like, <laughs> yes, that's, yeah. right. You get... that's right. It's like the thing they do out in Hollywood. The with Lifetime, like, Achievement, Lifetime Award. Achievement Award. You know. Dad! <laughs> it's over. <laughs> They're about to send you out to, to pasture. I don't know. Somebody wants to show. I, I, I'm, very, I'm very sanguine about all these things. If somebody wants to show my yeah. films, I don't care. Sure. Put them in perspective for all your kids and everything. Yeah. I mean, here. Let me talk about actors and actresses again. Yeah. Uma Thurman. Yep. Well, tell me about her. I mean, it seems to be she's, on a she's, rocket ship to yeah. ultimate stardom. It was very strange because I picked up the phone and called her yesterday. I haven't talked to her for some time. Yeah. And she says it's 10 years since we first met Terry. She was 16 years old when I met her yeah. at the Chateau Marmont. And when we did Munchausen, she was 17 and a half. And Uma is like one of these extraordinary creatures that are made by the gods and planted on Earth because... <laughs> the gods gave her everything she needed to be huge. <laughs> she's... She's incredibly intelligent, yeah. almost too intelligent. Yeah. Father's She's professor incre at Columbia. That's that. right. He was the first uh, non-Tibetan Buddhist priest. Right, right. Um, her stepfather is Timothy Leary, um, and it's uh, her godfather, which <laughs> it was. And, and, but so she's incredibly beautiful. But what's interesting about her is that, and I think what makes her more attractive is, one, from one angle, she's the most beautiful thing on the planet. She turns and it disappears. Yeah. And then she turns back, and it's back again. Yeah. And so you're constantly drawn forward and, and away from her. And... Uh, She's just, I mean, when we made Munchausen, she was 17 and a half, and she plays Venus, and she rises up from her shell. The shell opens, and there she is naked. 
And on this very day, I was having her do the first nude scene she'd ever done in her life. At 16. Her 17 by 17. then. Still not legal. Uh, her mother was on the telephone trying to talk her into going back to high school and get a diploma. And I said, too late, Uma. It's over. You're a fallen woman. I got your clothes off. <laughs> and, but she was quite extraordinary. And, uh, I, and she continues to just constantly yeah. go on you and on. You liked her in Pulp Fiction? Yeah. She was good. Yeah. She's, she's, I think she, I really liked her best in Henry and June. She was astonishing in that. But nobody saw the film. I did. Did you? Yeah. Fred Ward and, yeah, yeah. and who else was it? Uh, Annis, uh, uh, what's her yeah. name? And Annis Nan was yeah. about. But, yeah. uh, but who's, I can't remember her name, the French actress. The one that played Bruce Willis's girlfriend in Pulp Fiction. I can't, I can't either. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> else. Uh, Robin Williams. Mm. I mean. Again, another one that was sent down by the gods. Yeah. There's a mind that there's no other mind on the planet like that. It's the most extraordinary thing to be with Robin. I mean, Robin is also the sweetest man on the planet, but yeah. this mind, it's like it's, an, it's got all these antennae that are picking yeah. up every bit of knowledge in the and universe. And connect it better than anybody. And it goes like, whoop, in there, yeah. and then he juxtaposes it yeah. with things you would never imagine and weaves these, these magical moments. I, I, I'm always in awe of Robin. I just... But it's, I, I think, you know, there are those of us, maybe all, the, all of us are just mutants. Yeah. You know, and, and people play good, pay good money to see us freaks <laughs> do what we do. And there's nothing, we can't take credit for it, possibly. You don't know what you'd do if you couldn't direct films. No, I mean, I was but saying... Maybe that, be like, a carpenter. My maybe. dad was a carpenter, and I thought I was going to be one once, but uh, no, I think... And going back to cartooning, I actually really want to get old so I can be an oil painter. I want to learn how to oil paint. Have you done any of it? No, you, you, no, no lessons, but I know, no I know I'm going to be a good oil painter. It was like when I started animation. I'd never done it before, but the minute I did it, I picked it up. I could because you have what about you that you, makes you think that? A sense of color, a sense of... Uh, of composition. I, I just like... Paintings have been the things that in a way have informed me about everything. I mean, when I make films, they're not about other movies. Yeah. They tend to be, if I use sources, it's paintings, it's Bruegel, it's Bosch, it's Goya. Those are the things that really inspire me, not films. And so... I keep thinking, well, really I ought to pay back some of this by becoming a painter <laughs> and carrying on a tradition. Have you reached the point where those people who come to you, I mean, that because it's you, because you are not cut out of the same fabric mm. in terms of the way your mind seems to work in the yeah. films that you do, that it's a magnet for actors who might not otherwise be attracted to the script, but because it's a kind of experience that's different, they want to do it. That's probably true. The irony of all of this was that all yeah. the films I made early on, I didn't want actors in it. I always wanted to be the film to be the star. <laughs> and now I find I, I keep swatting the actors away. Big yeah. names keep coming. I, I don't know. It's, it's an odd one. Everything becomes ironic, ultimately, because it, it's all, it all goes backwards. I think what happens, because of the kind of films I make, most of the people in Hollywood don't knock on my door, which is great. The people that knock on the door are people who really, really want are to do smart it. and are yeah, good. Right. And so you cut out all the crap, basically. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's useful to have a bad reputation. One-Eyed Jacks is a favorite film of yours, the first directorial debut by... My, first Brandon. and only. Only, that's yeah. right. What is it about that that's so... I don't. I had to choose a film for this retrospective oh, okay. a couple of weeks ago. Right. And rather than choosing Citizen Kane and There's all no those, meaning in this. Let's be it? perverse. <laughs> but the, the truth is, when I first was in New York in 63, I was in 42nd Street in the winter, and I sat in there, it was a double bill, and I watched One Eye Jacks three times. Because yeah. it, it hit a certain note. And Carl Malden is in it. Carl Malden, Katie Girardo, yeah. um, Ben Johnson. Wow, uh, Stanley man. Kubrick was supposed to direct the film, had a falling out with Brando, and Brando directed the film. And it's the only time he's done it, and I actually think it's a great film. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to do Shakespeare? I was offered Midsummer's Night's Dream by Harvey Weinstein of <laughs> oh, Miramax. <laughs> Miramax, yeah. <laughs> that sounds and, like Harvey he's, 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 he's got $14 million. <laughs> Midsummer's Night's Dream, you can do total control. And I said, this is crazy. And I drove home, and on the way home, I worked out how to do it. And then by the time I, time I got home, I said, I don't want to work with Harvey. <laughs> now, listen to this. This is what you said. Each film is an attempt to create a world that makes a kind of sense, a kind of sense. Mm. Because the real one, the one we mm. live in, doesn't make much sense to me. It's the closest you get to playing God and getting paid for it. <laughs> what a wise person I am. <laughs> that that uh, does read well, doesn't it? It does, and you read it beautifully, I thought. <laughs> All right, let me take a look at another clip. This is Changing the Past. This is uh, Bruce and Madeline Stowe, who also yeah. is in this film, discuss whether he... <laughs> how relevant is this clip? Whether he is crazy or not. <laughs> Join us later, folks. Join us later. Here it is. <laughs> I should mention here, because it's somebody that mm. I, I really met the other night, I want to talk to sometime, Brad Pitt. Yeah. yeah. He's wonderful. He's a movie star. Yeah, no question. Yeah, it's just one of those things, again, 
I don't know. He's got it. It's just it's all there. And and the strange thing is that people want me to sort of tell extraordinary tales about how interesting he is. He's just the straightest, most decent, you know, yeah, earnest guy I've met for a long exactly time. And it's so right. hard for people to understand that, that yeah. he can be the center of world's attention and every woman in the world after him. And yet he's so solid. I think he, he's so Middle Western. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Middle that Western can be just, good. You know, that, that scene right there is my favorite scene. That was a moment in the film when Bruce became... Oh, my... That's all right, your mic. Your, <laughs> my mic! Ah! Right. That's actually when, your when battery Bruce, pack, I think. Mean. When Bruce reached a level of innocence and vulnerability that just made us all cry, and it's... I love moments of that, moments like that with actors, and, and it happens on the set, and it's such a rare thing. When it, whether it communicates in the finished film, one never knows, but on the set things happen and you can see a whole group of hardened technicians just suddenly oh, being oh, entranced and they're just yeah. drawn into this yeah. moment of an yeah. actor yeah. and that you happened can, there i know exactly what you mean mm. if, even doing this kind of thing if you're doing it on location people gather around yeah. because somehow what the person yeah. is saying is almost it's like has a magnet to yeah. it and people almost leaning in i wish people yeah. could re remember that i think that's, that's Stories around the campfire used to be like yeah. that, when the elders would gather. I'm sure that was far more magical than what we do in movies. Just a voice of an old man telling a story, a legend yeah. or whatever. And it's the theater of the imagination, too. That's right. Thank you very much, Terry. Pleasure Thanks. to meet you. <laughs> we'll be right back. Stay with us.